Hey guys, welcome back to the Investors Podcast, new YouTube series where we review the greatest books for business and life that have shaped our learning over the years. Hi, I'm Sean, and this channel is all about the principles of investing. From stock tips to iconic billionaires, the best strategies, and our favorite tools, the Investors Podcast has everything you need to know. So let's get started. <music> Today, I'm gonna to be sharing my learnings from Good to Great by Jim Collins. Collins is a methodical researcher who has authored a number of famous books detailing his findings from years of extensive case studies. Including his research team, they spent an aggregate of over 15,000 hours and five years investigating how companies transition from mediocrity to greatness. The first phase of their research was to spend six months vetting companies' financials to find those who underperformed or just matched the stock market averages for at least 15 years in a row, punctuated by a turning point where cumulative returns over the following 15 years were three times the market average. This is what he calls the good to great pattern. And they picked 15 years so as to exceed any one business cycle, lucky breaks, or just amazing CEOs to be sure the results were repeatable. They also removed companies that had excessively benefited from a massively growing industry. They wanted companies that had genuinely turned themselves around without the outside support of non-company specific conditions. For this group of great companies, they had exceptional stock market performance as a reward with 6.9 times the market average in the years following their transition point. While the book was originally published in 2001, these are timeless lessons originating from a number of great companies you've certainly heard of still today. And if you're a stock investor, you'll in particular want to look for these traits in the companies you pick. Well, let's find out what makes the best companies so great and be sure to check out our other book reviews in the links below after this video. Many people don't have great lives because it's too easy to settle for just a good one and many companies never become great for the same reason. Many great companies have always been great while most good companies have always just been good. So Collins asked himself, can companies ever transition from good to great? Picture a stock chart for a company that's flat on the left, then pivots dramatically and takes off. On a second chart, envision a company also with a flat stock price on the left, but this one continues being flat. This is the visual difference between good and good to great. Collins' list of good to great companies is just 11 spots long, including Abbott Labs, Circuit City, Fannie Mae, Gillette, Kimberly Clark, Kroger, New Corp, Philip Morris, Pitney Bowes, Walgreens, and Wells Fargo. If you'd invested $1,000 in a mutual fund of these so-called good to great companies in 1965, by 2000, you'd have had $500,000. Interestingly, many of these amazing results came from companies that had had years of mediocre stock performance. So why did these companies become great while many of their peers did not? Well, this is one of the main questions the book hopes to answer. For the second phase of their research, Collins' team contrasted the set of good to great companies with the list of peer companies who they competed with at the time. Within this list, it was split into two sets of comparison companies. The first set is of companies that were in the same industry during the same time with similar size who failed to become great. And the second set are what he refers to as unsustained comparisons, companies that made short-term transitions to greatness who failed to stay that way for an extended period. For phase three of the research, they deeply analyzed each good to great company and their comparison sets through interviews with the executive teams during these periods while considering metrics such as financial ratios, layoffs, and executive compensation to see what was significant. With all of their data and analysis, his research team then spent weeks debating and discussing each takeaway for these companies derived directly from their findings. And for the last phase of the research, the team went through an iterative process of testing hypotheses against this data, building frameworks, and throwing them out when they didn't work. So with this in mind, Collins highlights a few interesting takeaways in this chapter, firstly being that leaders of good to great companies were often humble, self-effacing, and quiet, more like Lincoln or Socrates. They figured out who the right people should be on their team, and importantly, figured out who to get rid of. Building on this, their transformation never had one miracle moment or a defining launch program, no single defining innovation or action. The process was underpinned by disciplined people consistently upholding disciplined thought and correspondingly disciplined action. 
So disciplined people, disciplined thought, and disciplined action are actually the three stages with which he divides the transformation process. In chapter two, Collins discusses further the qualities that defined the great leaders who helped their companies undergo good to great transitions. He tells the story of Darwin Smith, who in 1971 became CEO of Kimberly Clark and in 20 years guided the company to outstanding financial and stock returns while becoming a leader in consumer paper products. Smith was a quiet and simple man who found more comfort among farmers and plumbers, yet he brought a ferocious resolve in managing Kimberly Clark and committed to selling their mills, which had been the staple of the company for years while doubling down on consumer products. At the end of his career, he said that simply he never stopped trying to be qualified for his job. Smith is an example of a classic level five leader that channels their ego into building something greater than themselves. Collins explains that great leaders would rather look out from their porch and admire the enduring business they helped build, whereas good leaders build success while they're there only to watch the company fail after leaving, which leaves their ego validated and highlighting their importance to the company. See the company Rubbermaid as an example of this. After 40 quarters of growth and reaching greatness briefly under their CEO, when he left, in less than a year, the company began to crumble. Rather than evidence of this CEO's greatness, we should see this as a failure to build an enduring organization. In over two thirds of the comparison cases with non-great companies, these firms had gargantuan personality leaders who may have boosted temporarily their performance only to ultimately drag the organization down. This pretty well describes Lee Iacocca who saved Chrysler and found temporary greatness there until he pivoted to focusing on self-promotion and telling the story of their great success. He wanted to be known as one of the best CEOs in American business history while spending his time touring television shows and writing books that launched him to rock star status. While his personal stock soared, Chrysler stock underperformed the market by 30%. Only a buyout from Daimler Benz would save the company from his mismanagement. Level five leaders aren't just modest and humble, but rather they're ferocious leaders with unparalleled resolve. These are fanatically driven individuals with uncompromising commitments to producing results. These leaders are intolerant of mediocrity. See Charles R. Walgreens III, who realized that the company's future lay in drugstores, not restaurants. In one meeting, he declared that the company had five years to be out of the food service business, despite having over 500 restaurants at the time. And a few months later, when he overheard an employee discussing that they had just five years to complete this dramatic transition, he said no. Now you have four and a half years. Charles was a plow horse, grinding away relentlessly, while most leaders at mediocre companies are just show horses who focus on aesthetics. Out of 500 companies on the Fortune 500 list, only 11 companies made the list for good to great, and each one had a level five leader during their transition period. Harry Truman has an excellent quote here for describing these leaders. You can accomplish anything in life provided you don't mind who gets the credit. Chapter three is titled First Who, Then What, and emphasizes further the value in getting the right people first before trying to launch business initiatives. Collins uses a bus metaphor to capture this and explains that it matters less where you're taking the bus and more about getting the best people on the bus. People should be on the bus because they want to be with others on the bus, not because of a fixation with the destination. The right people don't need to be motivated, guided, or disciplined. They will have an inner drive to create something great. If you have the wrong people, it doesn't matter whether you find the right direction, you'll still have a poor company. A good vision with the wrong team trying to manifest it is doomed for failure. Collins highlights a number of examples where companies had similar strategies but different people and as a result had drastically different results. Quote, the moment you feel the need to tightly manage someone, you've likely made a mistake. Letting the wrong people hang around in all their inadequacies is unfair to the right people on a team as they're forced to compensate for them, and worse, you may even drive away the right people out of frustration. Good to great companies show the following pattern in management. They had more people who stayed on the bus longer or more people who left quickly. These companies didn't churn more or less though, but rather they churned better and they spent extensive time first assessing whether someone was in the right seat on the bus before deciding what to do with them. 
As Dave Nassif of Pitney Bowes put it, I used to be in the Marines, and the Marines got a lot of credit for building people's values. But that's not the way it really works. The Marine Corps recruits people who share the Corps' values and then provides them with the training required to accomplish the organization's mission. Great companies think about people the same way. On the other hand, mediocre companies had a quote, genius with a thousand helper models, as geniuses often don't want to help build a great caliber management team since they can come up with great ideas themselves and just need an army to implement them. Walgreens had a leader who was masterful at developing superstar teams and a great successor, whereas their competitor and Eckerd had a genius leader who held all of the company's plans inside his head. When he left to work in politics, Eckerd deteriorated quickly until later being saved by a bailout. The difference here is in building an organizational culture devoted to having the best and right people versus one that's wholly dependent on a single very capable individual who ultimately undermines the company's long-term success. So in other words, invest in a great system, not an emperor who is the glue holding the organization together. Chapter four is called Confront the Brutal Facts and it starts with a quote from the famed Winston Churchill. There is no worse mistake in public leadership than to hold out false hopes soon to be swept away. For Churchill and his struggle to defeat the Nazis, he embraced facts first more than anyone. He worried that people reporting to him would hesitate to deliver bad news or otherwise salute the reports, so in anticipation, he established a special office devoted solely to unbiasedly collecting relevant wartime statistics to share with him. All he wanted were the facts, just the facts. For the Pitney Bowes executive team in their annual meetings, they would spend about 15 minutes reviewing the past performance from the year before, and then two hours diving into the various possible obstacles they would have to face in the future. Collins describes them as being almost neurotic and unwilling to be complacent, even in the face of tremendous success. This is what it takes to go from good to great though. You just see the facts before you and embrace tackling them rather than hiding behind past performance. So this leads into one of the book's most powerful ideas, what Collins calls the Stockdale Paradox. He describes the various struggles and challenges each good to great company had to overcome and reflects that management teams both accepted stoically the brutal facts of reality while remaining unwavering in their perseverance. So the paradox captures this essence and specifically refers to Admiral Jim Stockdale, who was the highest ranking US military officer held in the Hanoi prisoner of war camp. And he was imprisoned for over eight years and tortured at least 20 times. So he created an elaborate internal communication system with other prisoners similar to Morse code that allowed him to help preserve morale among the many men. After his release, he earned a Congressional Medal of Honor. And Collins actually met Stockdale, who says that despite it all, he never lost faith in his eventual return home. When Collins asks who didn't make it out, Stockdale replies, quote, the optimists. Those who set expectations for their exit and maintained unrealistic hopes would eventually wear themselves down until they died of a broken heart. Stockdale says you must, quote, never lose faith that you will prevail in the end that you can never afford to lose with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. Collins' takeaway is that life is unfair and we'll all experience disappointments and crushing events with no one to blame. Saying, quote, what separates people is not the presence or absence of difficulty, but how they deal with the inevitable difficulties of life. The great leaders and companies embraced the Stockdale paradox. They deeply understood the challenges before them and without unwarranted optimism, held devoutly to overcoming them. For the next section, let's begin by asking a simple question. Are you a hedgehog or a fox? If you're confused, that's okay. This is a famous metaphor that Collins uses to capture differences in our focus as thinkers. The fox knows it's smart, maybe too smart. He's cunning and able to devise many complex strategies to attack the hedgehog. Though the hedgehog has one perfect defense. He rolls into a ball that spikes up, sending the fox retreating back again each time. So we can either be foxes who see the world through nuanced strategies and complexities, leaving themselves scatterbrained and lacking a single unifying view, or we can be hedgehog thinkers who take a complex world and simplify it into their core belief. Hedgehogs take a dizzyingly complex set of options before them and see what's essential while ignoring the rest. 
As Collins explains, each of the good to great companies were hedgehogs, while the comparison companies were foxes that chaotically jumped from tactic to tactic, hoping for success. Good to great companies became the best in their world at their refined strategy, but their peers sought growth at any cost. Although these are often costly acquisitions and terrible misallocations of capital, instead of a disciplined focus on reinvesting in their hedgehog concept. A hedgehog concept can be best described as a simple crystalline framework that flows from the intersection of the following three circles. What you can be the best set in the world, and equally important, what you cannot be the best set, what drives your economic engine, or in other words, your defining business metric, and lastly, what you're passionate about. The intersection of these three points is where you'll discover your hedgehog. This is what you're born to do, you're great at it, enjoy it, and you get paid to do it. A hedgehog concept isn't a goal to be the best at something or a plan, but rather a piercing clarity into what you actually have the potential to be the best at. Every company wants to be the best in a certain area, but to embrace the hedgehog is to recognize specifically where to focus, assuming there is indeed some core area that you could be the best in the world at. Good to great companies found what made them excited and chief executives at these companies described how their businesses drove their passion. They were deeply zealous about things like deodorant, diapers, tobacco, and mortgages. So while these probably aren't things you'll get jazzed up about, the insight is that these are things that they were fired up about. These companies and their employees saw a place where they could thrive while also being fanatically interested in producing the best of these products or services. A true hedgehog concept isn't so easy to find though. It took these companies four years on average for them to fully clarify it. You can't just slip away for two days in a courtyard Marriott with your team scouring through financial statements to uncover your hedgehog insight. Colin says that this would be like Einstein one day just deciding that he ought to become a great scientist and hoping that the secrets of the universe would unveil themselves to him in just 48 hours. Instead, it takes considerable time honestly searching for and questioning the most important metric underlying your business model. Picking the right metric is huge and varies meaningfully. For an airline, you may consider whether you want to maximize profit per customer, per seat on a plane, or per mile flown. These may all seem the same, but they have profound ramifications for how you'll choose to correspondingly structure your business. So finding this concept is an iterative process and getting the right people infused with the brutal facts and asking the right questions. Chapter six moves into examining with the right people in place and a hedgehog concept to guide their focus. How can organizations ensure they have a lasting culture of discipline? The typical business trajectory for successful startups is to scale too quickly and become undisciplined in all regards, hiring too many of the wrong people and launching products without cohesive oversight. So these entrepreneurial ventures turn to MBAs and executives from blue chip companies to implement a more hierarchical efficient system. While this reigns in the chaos, it also kills the spirit that made the company successful in the first place. Bureaucracy, of course, stifens innovation and spontaneity, leading to mediocrity. So the principle here, Collins says, is disciplined growth, which Abbott's CEO highlights by saying, quote, we recognize that planning is priceless, but plans are useless. For context, envision a pilot who, aided by expensive high-tech gadgets, operates within a defined system of constraints while still having the flexibility to make choices in real time. As this pilot coordinates constantly with air traffic control and monitors her various gauges, if a landing suddenly becomes too risky as crosswinds and storms disrupt the normal process, she'll simply pull the plane back up and reattempt the landing, which Collins says is a profound example for how we can envision disciplined growth within our organizations. There ought to be a defined framework for operation with various checkpoints and tools to assist us while still leaving the flexibility for us to make the necessary decisions at our own discretion. You don't want your pilots to be overly entrepreneurial and experimental, though they also must have ultimate responsibility for the airplane. While most corporate systems can afford to be less rigid than airlines, this analogy serves to highlight the value of freedom and responsibility within a framework. Great companies hired self-disciplined people who then focused on managing and improving the system, not managing the people. So great companies build great systems, which are run by great people. David Packard of HP says, quote, a great company is more likely to die of indigestion of too much opportunity than starvation of too little. 
The most effective investment strategy is a highly un undiversified portfolio where you are right. Being right means nailing the hedgehog concept and being undiversified highlights your commitment to upholding it. So how hard is it to be right? Colin says with the right people in place, it's really a question of whether you have the discipline to stop doing the wrong things more than it is about only doing the right things. So perhaps stop doing lists are more important than to-do lists. The next chapter opens with stories of non-profitable internet companies of the dot-com bubble who at times had no clear business plan. In this environment, many were more concerned with quickly building and flipping companies rather than creating ones that are built to last. Colin says bubbles come and bubbles go, so the point is not the tech bubble of the early 2000s, but rather that existing great companies find ways to adapt and endure, even when being disrupted by new innovations. The question isn't the role of technology, but rather how do good to great companies think about technology? Well, they use their hedgehog to drive technological utilization, but not the other way around. Good to great companies are often early pioneers of tech, such as Kroger, which adopted barcode scanners to manage inventory. And Walgreens used its website in a central database to enable customers to fill their prescriptions online so they could travel to any Walgreens store to pick it up. Technology is an accelerating factor for implementing your hedgehog concept, but not the reason for a good to great transition. Of the 84 executives Collins interviewed, 90% didn't rank technology in their top five reasons for their transition to greatness. While the media sought to attribute their success to their technological prowess, the good to great companies seldom spoke of it. Consistency and philosophy unencumbered by layers of hierarchy were often seen as explanations for success in addition to having the right people with the right mentality. Like winning the Daytona 500, good to great companies are about the drivers and their teams, not just who has the best cars. Chapter eight introduces another famous concept from this book, the flywheel. Imagine a large metallic flywheel that you must push on. At first, it's incredibly difficult to turn, but turn after turn, it builds momentum and compounds your investment of effort. It soon flies forward with nearly unstoppable momentum. If someone asked which push was most significant, well, the question would be ridiculous. Each one contributed marginally, but the effect built on itself over time. Good to great is a cumulative process like turning the flywheel. The media doesn't tend to cover the flywheel until it's already spinning at great speed, which distorts our perceptions of how easy and common it is to find success. Overnight success stories are seldom overnight and typically take years and decades to build to enough significance to be noticed by the outside world. A company's direction doesn't change overnight and may not even be clear for several years, but there are thousands of little pushes on the flywheel until enough momentum is built to be noticed. As an example, Collins tells the story of the legendary UCLA Bruins basketball program, which won NCAA championships 10 out of 12 years in a row under John Wooden, but Collins highlights that Wooden had coached the team for 15 years prior to this greatness as he worked in relative obscurity. During this time, he built his team slowly, focusing on refining their strategies for the full court press and recruiting great talent. At each good to great company and for any great organization, there's always a buildup period that sets a stage for the breakthrough. The flywheel effect with building tangible momentum and results serves not just to ingratiate support from the outside world, but also to improve internal morale as employees increasingly see the fruits of their labor and become more deeply invested in the hedgehog concept. So if you want to kickstart your own flywheel and learning more every day, my favorite tool is Audible. I used Audible to quickly listen to this book and it's helped me read dozens of books while on the go. If you're new to Audible and looking to read great books like this one, check out our sign up link below. For the last chapter of the book, I'd like to invoke a quote from the great Pablo Picasso. It's your work in life that is the ultimate seduction. Your work in life shouldn't be about just making money, but as is hopefully clear from this book, the members of truly great organizations found purpose in their unified mission. Using Hewlett Packard as an example, the company in the 1950s decided that its sole aim would not just be profits. At the time, this sort of stakeholder capitalism was quite radical as most businesses were constructed only to elicit profits for shareholders. Instead, the company's two founders took the most pride in their ability to provide teachings and examples for other companies on how to better manage their organizations. They had a purpose for existence beyond profits and cash flows. 
Collins described profits and cash flows as the blood and water vital for life, but they're not the purpose of life. Enduring great companies, of course, maintain profitability to survive, though they found greater purpose and motivation in both internal and external aims. Collins clarifies that it matters less what your core values are, whether in respecting employees, maximizing customer enjoyment, or seeking to clean up the earth. What matters simply is having these qualitative values to motivate you. Perhaps this then begs the question, why greatness? Why should we not just be content with being satisfactory? Collins suggests that it actually takes no additional effort to build a great business rather than just a good or mediocre one. Great companies actually simplify their operations, which makes managing them easier. So this book is not meant to create a list of all the additional steps necessary to build greatness, but rather to show that with focused, deliberate actions utilizing your current input effort, you can build an organization that produces even better outcomes for all involved. The point is to realize that much of what we're doing now is at best a waste of time, so why not then strive for greatness? The pursuit of greatness gives our lives meaning while participating in something truly first class. When you find the right passion and truly believe in its purpose, you'll naturally be inclined to make it great. So the question isn't really why greatness, but rather what makes you compelled to try and create it. That's it for this week, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'd really encourage you to read the book for yourself. If you do, make sure to use our link below to purchase a physical copy or use our Audible link to listen to it. Please also like, subscribe, and share your comments below if you liked it. We love hearing your thoughts, so tell us what are your biggest takeaways from this book? And which book should we review next? For more on Good to Great and Jim Collins, listen to Preston and Sig's classic We Study Billionaires podcast on the book and on episode Trey Lockerbie interviews Collins directly. See you next time.